if you bring someone like Kira Knightley in the film, you get more money. Mm -hmm. um, but then, but then everyone, it's an awful thing to say, everyone carries a value. So it's like, so thank God we had Kira and not because we just wanted our film finance, but she changed the whole making of our film um, by, by, by saying she wanted to be involved. But I, I could also have made that film. I couldn't have made the same film with, if I didn't have Kira, I would have made the, it would have made a different film. Hi there, welcome to Film Forums. My name is Aisha Bailey, and I have with me Tati Hatlam. Would you like to introduce yourself, Camille? I'm Cami Griffin, and I made a film called Silent Night. Fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit about what brought you to that project? Yes, um, I can. I don't know how long you want me to talk for, because I can ramble <laughs> up. Um, I tried to make lots of movies in the past, and no one would fund my films. Um, Maybe that's helpful to know. Um, have you seen the film? So, I mean, maybe you know why they don't want to make my movies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, and I, yeah, so I'd been trying for years and it was really painful and frustrating. And then um, Roman, one of my kids, decided he wanted to become an actor. So we spent two years trying to get a job and then we moved to America for six months and he, he coincidentally got to audition for this film, Judge a Rabbit, and then he got to be in Judge a Rabbit. And then I was on set and I was watching Taika, the director working. I was like, oh my God, he's so clever. He's using comedy to, to talk about Nazis. And I was like, wow, that's really clever. And I thought, oh, well, maybe that's what I could do, comedy. So I have to credit him for that. He inspired me to use um, uh, a device I'd never considered before, which was humor. I mean, I, I actually, my first two short films were kind of funny. They were dark comedies. But it, I'd got a little bit dark and moody and depressing as my writing projects went on. And and uh, anyway, so I thought, okay, I'm going to write a dark comedy and that will, that will change things. And I decided that this was my kind of last attempt to get a film made. And what I would do differently was I wouldn't ask any of the British film studio for money. I was like, I'm not going to go to the BFI or from four BBC films uh, because they've rejected me for so long. And I, be I was becoming cynical and, and hateful and resentful. So I, I wrote site and I was like, I'm just going to try and make this for a little money. So, and, and then I was like, okay, where am I going to get the money? Now, little money, you still need money if you had little money. And I, we didn't have any money. So I said to Ben, my husband, oh, look, I'm going to ask Matthew Vaughan for some advice because my, my husband had worked with him and I'd met him in the, over the years in the past. And Ben was like, I don't think Matthew um, is going to make this kind of movie. It's not his kind of movie. I was like, no, but, you know, he might, he might offer me some advice. You know, he did Lock Stock years ago, made that film for no money. You know, he... Um, so I went to Matthew for advice and he said, let's make this movie. I, we love it. We want to make this film. So that really, that's how it happened. Yeah. So did you do like film school and things or did you just kind of make shorts and learn along the way that way? How did you come up? Yeah, I mean, I made a list the other day because um, one of my producers was, she couldn't quite get the level of frustration I was coming at. Um, not from our experience on this film, but from, um, well, like we didn't get into the BFI London Film Festival, so I got to try not to be too negative, but I was like, I knew they wouldn't take our movie. <laughs> they didn't find our movie, they wouldn't take it. Um, and just for myself, I made a list of all the experiences I'd had, and I went to film school when I was 19, I'm 47 now. Uh, and I, by no means do I think this has to be anyone else's journey, but it just was the journey I experienced. Um, went to film school, then I, I wanted to become a cinematographer, so I became a camera trainee and I worked in the camera department and that, that in itself was a whole other kind of like, God, I mean, it's easier to probably win the lottery than it is to become a camera assistant in this industry. It was like mm. so hard. Um, and so I did that for years and I loved it, but also I found it kind of painful and disturbing, um, but I learned so, so much. And then I realized as I was uh, on set all the time, that I was drawn to the stories and the performances. And I was like, actually, maybe I don't want to be a cinematographer. Maybe I want to be a filmmaker. I'd already always knew I wanted to make films, but I didn't, you know, uh, I, I didn't know that I could have the permission to want to be a filmmaker. That, like it was such a big, you're like, if you go, I want to be a filmmaker. And someone looks at you like, really, you? Like, you want to be a filmmaker? So I don't know if that happens. I'm like, I want to be an actress. And they go, really? I mean, don't you, really? I mean, how are you going to do that? Do you know what I mean? So it took years to me to find that I didn't have to have permission to become a filmmaker. Um, so I started making short films and I, so I made this list. I mean, I did every scheme and film school and I did everything I could to try and get approval from the industry to get funding to make a first feature. 
I made seven short films. I made endless teasers. Uh, so I, I then went to the Bing of Film Lab, which was an incredible film school in Amsterdam that did um, like a writing lab and um, a directing lab. I went back there twice. And, and then I did these development workshops in the UK that Creative England had, you know, short film schemes and they had low budget feature film schemes. And then I did I features three times. I mean, I literally did everything. I couldn't, and, and sometimes I've forgotten the things. And then, you know, you, 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 I mean, the years would just go by with these applications and I'd get close. And then I became like queen of the shortlist. I was always on the shortlist. Um, and I think that the, the hardest bit was probably when I did get actually onto iFeatures and I got, you know, I did the whole year thing. And they, we got down to the last eight, I think, and they were financing three films, which was the year they made Lady Macbeth. And that was hard to recover from um, because it just was just, I mean, I, I've, I feel depressed talking. I feel depressed for you guys listening to this. It's like, it just wouldn't end. So it was actually the point where they say, when you stop banging your head, mate, I, it was the point where I naturally gave up that things changed. Um, and, 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 and in my, because of my character, I mean, I hadn't given up, but given up with them, but things got better. And maybe if I'd been less tenacious, I would have given up earlier, but then I wouldn't have found myself in this other situation. But actually, the positive end of the story is that I found the right home. I mean, it wasn't an easy home to be in. Matthew's a very ambitious uh, taskmaster. You know, he's an extraordinary um, boss, but he's, he's not easy either. You know what I mean? But he was, the, he was where I belonged because he had courage that they didn't have. And, and uh, so thank God for that, you know. But I don't want anyone to have to go through what I went through hear it all the time do you know what I mean like it's it is your story isn't um like you're saying you know that it's negative and depressive but everyone watching this is watching it because they're frustrated a lot of the time yeah. right you know, they, they're trying to get into the industry and they don't know where to turn and they're like well you know if I can hear how this person did it maybe I can learn from that and that's the whole point of the podcast is to hear those and to kind of make people feel sometimes you know it's okay that it's not right now you know what I mean just keep keep going with your hustle you know what I mean and my advice would be no matter what the journey is or how long it takes is that when you're not getting what you want you keep training and learning more whether that's you know making another short film or making a video or I, I at one point I volunteered at the local prison and I did training at the local prison and then I made some videos for them I made videos for my kids school I was I would do anything you know and and weirdly enough, I, I was like, I said to my husband, what, should I be embarrassed that I'm making videos for the local school, the kids' school? And he was like, no. And I actually found it really inspiring because I'd done every training. I could have I'd done everything I could have done in the industry. I was like, but the point is I just kept go. I kept doing, if, if I got rejected, I tried feeding myself with, um, with uh, an educational experience, you know? Um, um, and, and, and that's why those film schools or those development courses, they're all really good and really important because you learn. And I think the point is what I was trying to say is that when you then do get your break, you get to be good. Like, I don't think you can try for so long and then turn up and do a bad job. You know, you just, that can't be a possibility. And I think uh, that's one of my, one of my fundamental um, lessons, I suppose, I've learned is that whilst I was struggling, I was learning a lot. Um, so that when I did get my chance, um, I mean, I don't mean this arrogantly, but I could turn up and do a good job, you know. Otherwise, it's wasted. Like, don't yes. fight for yeah, the opportunity. You're preparing yourself. Yeah, but just don't fight for an opportunity and then turn up and not know what you're doing, you know. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that's helpful. No, I think that was really interesting what you said. And I was going to mention your short, um, short films. And I wondered if anything took you by surprise or there was anything in the process that, you really didn't expect in comparison to the production of the short films with this um, feature of Silent Night? Um, I don't think that, I don't think you can achieve in a short film what you can achieve in a feature. I mean, it's just obvious thing to say, but I don't think it comes close. And I think some people have made breathtaking short films. And I think my short films were good. I don't think any of them were breathtaking. I think they were all good. And what was good about them is I could, uh, as I turned them off my website uh, about a year ago. I was like, I don't know if I want to talk about, like, but I think I learned an awful lot. And I think what was great thing about a short film is no one can stop you making a short. I and mean, you can make a short film on your iPhone. You can make, anyone can make a short film now. And when people say to me, oh, 
uh, you know, I just want to do this. I'm like, we'll do it. Just like stop talking about it and do it. So that's fundamental. So I, but nothing can prepare you. I think the short films were really important, but actually the the directing actors courses I did, the 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 screenwriting courses I did, the the time on set working the camp, that stuff for me, what's helpful about making the films, whether it was the short films or like I said, the school videos was just making a decision. I think what directors have to do on set, and I got very frustrated when I was a camera assistant, when you want to go home and the director can't make a bloody decision. You're like, all they have to do is make a decision. That They are paid and employed to make a decision. And when they don't make a decision, uh, you know, the crew is sitting there going, oh God, I haven't seen my kids or I want to go and eat or I'm starving or I need to wash my clothes tonight, whatever it is. So I remember as a crew, I knew that when it was my chance, I was like, I'm never going to waste anyone's time. I'm going to make sure I know how to make a decision. Uh, that's whether you want the dress in blue or red or you want the shot here or here. So I think as long as you're training how to be equipped to make choices and to, and to um, empower other people to make the right choices, then you're not wasting your time. So I think the short films were really important, but so was all of it, you know. Um, I, I got an email last night from a woman called Judith Weston who uh, had an, she was one of the tutors at the Binger Film Lab in, um, in, uh, in Amsterdam. She's an American and she actually does um, courses online for people and she taught us how to direct actors. And it was only a week's workshop and obviously you can't do a week's workshop now because she's not teaching it, but she does these online. Set. And I mean, it was life-changing. And I remember that when I was on the set and I couldn't get the kids to always do what I needed them to do, or I couldn't explain myself to the actor. These tools kicked in, you know, that she taught, that she taught us at film school. And I was like, thank God, thank God for that. I mean, she taught us lots of different ways to get a performance out of someone. So I don't think I could have made this film without her and without had that experience. And then um, I did lots of different things over the years and they all seemed to help. So uh, even the training I had at the prison, I did um, training in, um, what's the word, restorative justice, where you're trained to negotiate or to be um, a mediator. Even that was helpful with the filmmaking. So I think for people who want to make films, if they get the door slammed on them, just keep going, but find other avenues. Like all these tools are going to really be empowering um, so that when you get your chance, people will go, oh, that's, she's, she's interested or he's interesting on let's make their next movie or let's help them make their next movie. Perfect. Fly! Oh, did you bleed on the carrots? Will I die? Yep, probably. Grandma! Happy Christmas. You're still alive? Yes, I think so. So my other question that you kind of touched on earlier um, was kind of the process of sh securing investors and how that plays a role in securing your kind of all-star cast, knowing that um, three three members were your children, which was, yeah, lovely. <laughs> um, you don't want to outprice yourself, right? So someone said to me the other day, oh, I want to make this movie, and it's like this, and I was like, you, but you, you, you want to make a film like the size of, um, a, like, Scorsese's 10th movie. I was like, you're never going to be able to make that as a first feature. That's just ludicrous. Like, no one's going to give you the money. No one's going to give you $50 million to make your first film, right? Unless, I don't know, you're Jeff Bezos' nephew. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? It's like... <laughs> It's like, uh, first of all, inspire to do something you can achieve. That's the first thing. Um, and then if you bring someone like Kira Knightley in the film, you get more money. Mm -hmm. um, but, then, but then everyone, it's an awful thing to say, everyone carries a value. So it's like, so thank God we had Kira, and not because we just wanted our film finance, but she changed the whole making of our film um, by, by, by saying she wanted to be involved. But I, I could also have made that film. I couldn't have made the same film with if I didn't have Kira. I would have made the, It would have made a different film. It would have just been a. And sorry to interrupt you. Did you so when you were planning this and writing it, was she in your mind? Were you like it would be incredible no. if I could get Kira? No. Okay. No, I thought I was going to make a movie for eighty grand and like go around all my posh friends and ask me to lend me a grand. I mean, I I didn't. And when it actually came to doing that, I couldn't do it. I didn't know how to do it, and I didn't even know eighty people who had a grand. But um, that was the plan. It was like, maybe I could borrow some of Rem's wages and uh, go to the bank and get a loan. And I was going to make it with all my actor friends that I'd met over the years making my short films. And, and, and like I said, I went to Matthew for advice and he said, well, we'll make a movie. And I was like, oh, wow. 
And he was like, Ben said, you want a couple of hundred grand? I said, well, I don't want that. Obviously, more, more than he went, you, know, you need proper money, you need a proper cost. So he brought ambition with him. But I'm just saying that that, that was like um, winning the lottery, in a sense, for a first time filmmaker. That's quite rare. Um, but the point is, it was an achievable film um, because it was, uh, was set in one location. But the more elements you add to your story, the more things that, you know, I'm talking like practically now, you know, the more, more locations, the more costs that they cost, cost money and time. So there's some, you know, we all saw the Blair Witch Project. I mean, what a genius thing they did. They went into the forest with a camera and a couple of actors. And uh, so I'm just, so don't, don't outprice yourself. Like be realistic about what you can achieve. just want to make sure that you understand that as your parents we are not to blame the amazing thing is so when i wrote it no i didn't have clear mind but when i started talking to matthew and he was like what do you want to make how do you want to make this film i was like well matthew's a, a person who who can bring things to the table right that's an extraordinary thing about and he's ambitious and he's a very very clever man and he's a respected filmmaker and so i said well you know we want kira right she's like the perfect if we're going to parody the genre we uh she's the perfect person and he went oh yeah great idea anyway i didn't hear it was then it was the summer holidays and i didn't hear anything and then he called me a few months later he was like oh kira's read it she wants to meet you and i was like you're kidding me he was like no no like, wow that's amazing and then suddenly our project was happening because we potentially had kira knightley attached because even then he wasn't going to give me the money or raise give his investors money to me to make a movie without a film star in it yeah he said, you need a film star now, not everyone can get a film star. Matthew can get a script to Kira Knightley, but not everyone can get a script to Kira Knightley. Do you know what I mean? I mean, Kira Knightley gets a script all the time. I'm sure her agent is probably put half in the bin, I imagine. Maybe they don't. That's the rude thing to say. I don't mean that. But, like, they go, who, they go, who's Camille Griffin? Oh, we've never heard of her. Mm. They go, oh, yeah, Roman, he was interesting. He was in JoJo, but they still, they're like, okay. But they go, oh, Matthew Vaughan's producing. That helps. But that was a win-win situation. And I don't think anyone, everyone should aspire to have that as because I think it's a hard situation to be in. Yeah. Um, um, but, but people make brilliant films all the time. So the financing came um, with, 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 with Kira and Matthew because she had trust in him and the project and me and the material. She was excited by that. But if I hadn't had Matthew, maybe she'd gone, well, I like her and I like her script, but if they're going to make me sit in a dirty caravan for a week, I don't want to make this movie. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think there was enough people attached that they felt safe. Yeah. yeah. That I wasn't maybe the securing element. Um, but there's always that thing, there's that triangle. They say that you can't have, like, every all three corners of the triangle, you can't have money and this and that and that. You have to compromise, you know? Yeah. You can't have money and time and cost. It's like you either have cost, money no time or time it's like there's i can't remember the actual di the triangle but but the moral of the story is it's like just go don't just go outside the box a bit and go well what have i done wrong or what haven't i thought of and who haven't i approached and um you know you know how there's that story in hollywood that every dentist has written a script well that maybe go to your dentist for money i don't know do you know what i mean but um, <laughs> that's something i noticed while watching your film though it was it was something that i hadn't seen before and it actually made me question what would I do? I mean, I know th throughout the film you have this overhanging kind of doom of the inevitable. Um, and then actually I thought about it and I, I put my laptop down and I literally lay in my bed and I was like, what would I have done? And I think that was a really clever thing. And it made me this mix of genres, the contrasts that you created. And like you said, use the word parody. That was so clever. Obviously, Kira Knightley, Love Actually, it's iconic. So I was kind of like, what am I expecting? And that is something that I was left thinking, like, what have I just watched? That merge of genres was really, really clever. I really enjoyed Thank that. You. I'm so, th I'm grateful you did. Thank you. And I think I, I think in setting myself free, because I knew I wasn't going to go back to the gatekeepers, I could write whatever I wanted. And I think that's also, I think for years, one of my mistakes was I was looking for approval. And maybe somehow that was influenced in my writing. It's like, just write what you want to write. And, and if you have to write it and then, but be prepared that that might not be the right thing and then just keep going, but maybe don't make decisions because you think that's what they want or what people, it has to be what, you know, like just, I let myself free. I was like, okay, I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to, I'm going to kill a load of posh people. You know, that wouldn't that be fun. So yeah, I think that's an interesting thing to consider. I really do care about, um, you know, I think it's important to support, to have these conversations because people think it's easier and it, it, it's hard or easier. And I just think it's, it's, 
it's an important conversation to to keep going. So I I believe in that.